the last one. It's a, it's a honor that uh, Michael Wine is back with us. Uh, today he's going to, the title of his talk is Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, Diplomatic Progress in Combating Anti-Semitism. Mike is the Director of Government and International Affairs for the Community Security Trust, and he's also a consultant for the <coughs> European Jewish Congress. And last year, uh, Mike took, a, took myself and a colleague on a tour of the CST, and it's an incredible organization. I think, uh, perhaps unfortunately, but I think other communities should uh, emulate the model that uh, Mike Warren was instrumental in putting together in the Community Security Trust. It's unbelievable what they do in terms of policing, working with communities, and, uh, and the like. Um, Mike is also the Communications Director of the Community Security Trust the Director of the Defense and Group Relations Division of the Board of Deputies of the of British Jews, and he's also a representative on the OSCE uh, on these issues. Um, he was previously on a panel and drafted the working def which helped to, he helped to work, uh, create the working definition on anti-Semitism of the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, and this definition actually is a very important uh, contribution to the discussion and debate because it, I think it defined anti-Semitism in a contemporary context, which included demonizing and then, uh, illegitimizing Israel. And this is the definition that many uh, organizations and governments are actually adopted. So it was a very key contribution. He's also the member of the Metropolitan Police Authority of London. Uh, with the, he works with their race-hate uh, crime form. It's a criminal side subgroup of, and the independent advisors group of the London Criminal Justice Board. Uh, and he represents the CST on INACH, I-N-A-C-H, which is the International Network Against Cyber Aid. He's also the author of books and articles. He's widely published uh, throughout the world. And he really works internationally on protecting the Jewish community against anti-Semitism, but also working on counter-terrorism and liaison, <coughs> working with police forces and community groups, not only in the UK, but literally throughout the world. So it's an uh, honor that you're back for your second time. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you'll forgive me, but I'm going to read my presentation. Um, it's easier for me. I hope that what I say will provoke a lot of questions and discussions. One of the peculiar aspects of the work that I do is that there are lots of acronyms. Um, organizations and initiatives uh, have initials. Uh, I will try and spell out what these mean initially, uh, but if you get confused, please don't hesitate to ask me afterwards. During the late 1990s and 40 years after the end of the war, international organizations became aware of the recrudescence of anti-Semitism on a major scale. This was combined with the growing awareness that it is now coming from new and different directions, although the traditional sources had not gone away. <clears throat> For Jewish organizations, this was vividly highlighted by the events at the UN World Conference Against Racism in, at Durban in 2000, where a noxious combination of states, mostly Middle Eastern and led by Iran, and many so-called human rights organizations, conspired to demonize Israel and Zionism and to intimidate Jewish and Israeli delegates. Whether this is new anti-Semitism or whether it is just the old anti-Jewish anti myths and tropes dressed in a new disguise is immaterial. Their increasing acceptance by new audiences who have no memory of the Shoah or the events that led to the creation of the State of Israel, as well as increasing opposition <coughs> to the USA and to globalization, however, pose significant dangers to Jews. Against this background, governments themselves, spurred by some Jewish organizations, came to realize that there was a need for action at the international level. Their interest was quickened in the aftermath of the Intifada and Al-Qaeda's attacks on the USA when anti-Semitic incidents around the world rose alarmingly. These developments led certain Jewish organizations to seek redress at the international level, and the resultant diplomatic offensive against anti-Semitism 
has therefore been carried on through the medium of various intergovernmental organizations. Some of these international organizations have played a greater and more effective role than others, but most initiatives have been more than declaratory. They involve programs at ground level and within territories which have historically provided fertile territory for anti-Semitism. Among international organizations, the first to recognize and react to the changing circumstances was the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I'll explain all of that if you want later. Which in its December 2002 foreign ministerial conference in Porto noticed concern over the manifestation of aggressive nationalism, racism, chauvinism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism and violent extremism wherever they may occur. The statement did more than express concern, however. It went on to authorise the OSCE to take action and to ensure effective follow-up via the Human Dimension Meetings, which take place annually, organised by the agency's Human Rights Affiliate, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the acronym for which is ODEA. <laughs> the OSCE is replete. I mean, it, it gets really quite funny because there's one event that takes place which is described by four separate acronyms, one after the other. <laughs> A consequence of all of this, therefore, was the 2003 Vienna meeting on anti-Semitism, the first high-level conference devoted specifically to anti-Semitism. More than 400 participants from governments and NGOs considered means to prevent anti-Semitism, such as awareness raising, education, anti-discrimination legislation, and legal and law enforcement initiatives. The meeting was preceded by a two-day seminar on human rights and anti-Semitism, organized by the Jacob Blaustein Institute, at which Jewish representatives sought to engage with and enlist the support of some of the major international human rights groups, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. That meeting, however, was less than successful, and in the end, the Jewish groups were unable to garner any real support from the international human rights groups, a situation which still prevails. The Vienna meeting, however, needed a proper follow-up, an event which would engage governments at the highest level and ensure continuing support for programs. This led to the Berlin Conference of 2004. Initially, there was resistance to such a meeting at the highest levels, but US diplomatic pressure a change in the attitude of the French government which had begun to react to the rise in anti-Jewish violence and a resolution by the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly which is a parallel body of parliamentarians elected by their member states in July 2004 overcame the opposition of the other states. A quid pro quo had been demanded for holding the anti-Semitism meeting in Vienna and this was for a separate meeting on racism, Islamophobia and other forms of, it, of intolerance. While some disappointment was expressed at the time, it's now deemed to strengthen Jewish activist arguments to be able to point to the singularity of anti-Semitism, while at the same time rooting it within the general arena of racism. The declaration of the Berlin Conference, which noted, and I quote, unambiguously that international developments or political issues, including those in Israel or elsewhere in the Middle East, never justify anti-Semitism, broke a logjam in pointing to the source of much of this new anti-Semitism. The declaration also committed OSCE participating states to collect and maintain reliable information and statistics on anti-Semitic and other hate crimes, and to work with the Parliamentary Assembly to determine periodically annual reviews of anti-Semitism. It tasked ODIA to work systematically on collecting and disseminating information identifying best practice for preventing and responding to anti-Semitism and, if requested, to offer advice to participating states. The first step in pursuing these aims was the Paris meeting on cyber hate two months later, which examined the increasing use of the internet to promote anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. On this occasion, the OSC failed to follow up the recommendations and it took until March 2010, a month ago, for the organization to hold its second expert meeting on the same subject. Here some the delegates, myself included, noted that no progress had been made in the intervening six years and that the issues had become more complicated with the development of social networking sites. <laughs>
The Berlin Conference was followed by two more high-level conferences in Cordoba, <laughs> Spain, and in Bucharest, and a third is planned for June uh, this year in Astana, capital of Kazakhstan. Uh, that's because Kazakhstan has the chairmanship of the OSCE, has a rotating chairmanship. The purpose is to provide a high-level forum for states' representatives to demonstrate their government's progress in combating anti-Semitism, and equally to press recalcitrant, recalcitrant states to increase their efforts. Intermittent experts meetings are also held to draw attention to emerging concerns and to assist the personal representative on anti-Semitism to the OSCE chairman in office. The concept of this personal representative follows the practice of intergovernment agencies to appoint high-level experts tasked with approaching governments in a more discreet and effective manner than may be possible via conferences where time and space are at a premium. In this regard, the two personal representatives so far, Professor Gerd Weiskirchen, who is a German uh, Member of Parliament, recently retired, and Rabbi Andrew Baker, have sought to help some member states to recognize and counter anti-Semitism within their borders. ODIA now publishes a series of important reports, including the annual hate crimes in the OSCE region, that's 55 states, uh, which collects and analyzes data from the member states and the NGOs, which, and which includes a substantial section on anti-Semitism. The report also measures progress against agreed targets such as adherence to national and international instruments. <coughs> in addition, ODIA publishes other reports, including Education on the Holocaust and Anti-Semitism, Hate Crime Laws, A Practical Guide, and a series now of school books for high school students in various of the OSCE languages. These, I think, are actually vital. <coughs> uh, I can talk more about that, if you like, in a few minutes. Uh, ODIA's Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Information System, which is called TANDIS, has a database which contains national legislation against hate crime, model legislation for those states which have yet to draft such legislation, and over two million other pieces of relevant information for government's use. Anybody can access it, but it's intended primarily for governments to use. Parallel initiatives by the European Union and its associated bodies were fraught with problems in the early stages, but real efforts are being made now to readjust the balance. A report on anti-Semitism, which was called Manifestation of Anti-Semitism in the European Union from 2002 to 3, published by the European Monitoring Centre on Racism and Xenophobia, EUMC, but renamed the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency, or FRA, in 2007, was in fact two separate reports. A country analysis prepared by the Berlin University Centre for Research on Anti-Semitism, the ZFA, and a report on perceptions of anti-Semitism in the European Union. These reports were reasonable, given the short time allowed for their preparation, but controversy erupted when the EUMC sought to bury the first report, delay publication of the second, and then publish both with a press release at variance with the assessments made by the report's authors. The EUMC had failed to understand that anti-Semitism is now frequently a consequence of the overspill of Middle East tension, and is increasingly promoted by Islamists. Muslim communities also suffer from prejudice, and the EUMC, which is a body established to monitor this phenomenon, found difficulty in reconciling the fact that the victims of one sort of prejudice could be responsible for promoting another form of prejudice. Since 2004, FRA has published an annual review on anti-Semitism within the EU, based on reports submitted by its Raxon network of national focal points another acronym, I'm afraid. But as with the annual OSCE report, it fails to provide a complete picture, as too many states are still incapable of or unwilling to submit data. Nevertheless, the annual survey of anti-Semitism in the EU is a very useful guide. A second, a second initiative, undertaken by the European Jewish Congress and the Council of European Rabbis, involved a series of meet meetings with elected European Commission leaders designed to demonstrate that the direction from which anti-Semitism was coming was changing, and that anti-Jewish violence rose when tension in the Middle East increased. These meetings continue intermittently, and the most recent, held at the Commission in Brussels in 2009, <coughs> featured speakers from FRA, Jewish communities, and a British Muslim leader, 
whose working focus is on combating Muslim anti-Semitism. <coughs> of real lasting benefit, however, has been, been the EUMC working definition of anti-Semitism, which Charles mentioned. When the EUMC considered their first report in 2003, they found that many respondents couldn't define anti-Semitism in today's political climate. It also lamented the fact that no two experts could define anti-Semitism in the same way. You know, ask three Jewish intellectuals what anti-Semitism is, and you get pages and pages, uh, and none of them will agree on what it is. Um, they, they therefore asked uh, selected Jewish NGOs and academics to provide a simple working definition that would encompass anti-Semitic definition or demonization of Israel, and which could also be used by their own uh, Ratson network of national focal points and by law enforcement agencies. The international consultation involved many of the major Jewish agencies and prominent Jewish and non-Jewish academics. The result led to final draft negotiations between representatives of the American Jewish Committee, European Jewish Congress, the EUEC, EUMC's Director and Head of Research, and the ODIA Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Programme Director and anti-Semitism expert. Following acceptance by the EUMC, the definition was circulated to interested parties with the expectation that it would assist their work. However, it was never intended that it be legislated, and al however, although it was never intended sorry, that it should be legislated, it has been adopted by the OSCE and by the US State Department as a working guide. Another major step forward within the EU is expected when the Common Framework decision comes into effect this November. Although it's been much watered down from the original stronger draft, it nevertheless places on all European Union member states a requirement to legislate against the promotion of hatred, including anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and denial of genocide. The Council of Europe, with a much larger membership than the EU, also acted by passing policy resolutions condemning anti-Semitism. But its racism monitoring body, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance, ECRI, has taken on the issue and in a really effective and businesslike man manner. ECRI's mission is to monitor member states' adherence to European legislation and the European Convention on Human Rights in particular. It does so by four yearly reviews of states' compliance with European and their own national legal instruments, as well as occasional thematic recommendations. Member states are expected to act on ECRI recommendations, and the current third cycle of country reports is paying particular attention to the improvements made by members over the 12-year cycle. In 2004, ECRI also published a general policy recommendation on combating anti-Semitism which gave advice to member states on legislation and the action required by national criminal justice agencies. The ECRI 2010 Review of Progress notes that its three-pronged program of activities, country reports, thematic reports, and engagement with civil society has allowed it to promote real legislative progress, effective use of legislation, and enabled the spread of best practice between member states. Despite the well-founded belief that the United Nations has latterly been ineffective in defending human rights, it has nevertheless made a contribution to combating anti-Semitism. Several denunciations of anti-Semitism in the context of denouncing racism in 2002 and 2005 were followed by the more practical decision to establish the International Day of Commemoration for Holocaust victims on 27th of January and an unequivocal condemnation of Holocaust denial signed by all UN member states except Iran in 2005. Even the ridiculous 2009 Durban follow-on conference in Geneva attempted to move away from the ill-fated 2001 conference, which I referred to before, by calling on member states to counter anti-Semitism and anti-Arabism and Islamophobia, but it mentioned anti-Semitism specifically to take measures to prevent the emergence of mo movements promoting hatred, to implement General Assembly resolutions on Holocaust commemoration and Holocaust denial. Among the more practical and long-lasting outcomes of international diplomacy, and one which stemmed not from Jewish urging, but the concerns of international statesmen, 
was the declaration from the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust in 2000. Initiated by the then Swedish Prime Minister, the conference agreed to establish an international task force to ensure that states recognize the magnitude of the Holocaust and its lasting scarring effects on Jews and humanity as a whole. So far, 27 states have signed the Stockholm Declaration and put in place annual Holocaust commemorations and educational programs. To ensure enlargement and consistency, a permanent office was established in Berlin, funded by the German government and with a revolving chairmanship shared by signatory states. It might be argued that 10 years' diplomatic effort to counter anti-Semitism has been of little avail given the dramatic increase in incidents and deterioration of discourse following the 2009 Operation Castlet, Israel's incursion into Gaza. I think this, however, would miss the point. At the turn of the millennium, governments were recognised, they were reluctant to even recognise that anti-Semitism was growing. Since then, states have recognised the dangers to society's health by not combating the phenomenon, They've agreed a common yardstick by which it can be measured, the working definition, and recognise that it also comes from new and different directions. Many have also legislated against incitement of anti-Semitism in its various forms, including Holocaust denial. Those that have not yet done so, in Europe at least, will have to have done so by the end of this year. If there have been setbacks, it's because some states are still incapable of or unable to measure anti-Semitism. And there are various reasons for, them, for this, although they've agreed to do so at an uh, intergovernmental level. And consequently, the picture is lacking in total clarity, although the broad outlines are apparent. Sorry. However, the monitoring role is increasingly filled by NGOs, and the EU, the Council of Europe, and the OSCE all recognise and rely on, this, on their vital work. Also, I have to say, there's a certain fatigue become apparent, uh, and the progress made has not always been continuous or consistent. But without the determination of a handful of individuals and their governments, the progress made thus far, I think, would have not been possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so my point for a really good paper. You, I'm sort of engaged in some of these institutions, but you've actually clarified things for me, so I appreciate it. It was really a great overview of what's going on. But I have a one question. Um, when, I, when I spoke in Berlin in uh, the OSCE meeting, I was supposed to speak on statistical analysis of hate crimes. And I specifically, that was the only way that I, could, I was able to get into the conference. <laughs> and my perp the reason why I went was to talk about Iran and the incitement to genocide. So instead of speaking about statistical compilations and how to analyze uh, hate crimes, I spoke about Iran how they're using the protocols of the elders of Zion, spreading hate uh, internationally, and also uh, obviously pursuing uh, uh, the demonization of Israel and the nuclear weapons program. And some of the people were happy I spoke, and there were a lot of people that were furious that I spoke because I didn't speak to statistics. So I was wondering, so my question is, it seems that the, all the, the OSCE and other major European countries are, are intent on analyzing statistics or trying to find more effective ways to measure what's going on on the ground, which I think is important. And yet at the same time, there's a social movement in, in the Middle East and the Islamic world through the Iranian Revolutionary Regime and other organizations that are open, honest, consistent in their spreading of the protocols of the elders of Zion and their drive to exterminate Jews. I mean, we in the West seem to have our heads in the sand, but they're very, you know, if you read their fatwas and their religious rulings and their ideology and their, their political and military policies, they're straight up, open, consistent, and you have to respect their honesty. So you have this sort of, and of course, Holocaust denial goes on. You have the Iranians who come to places like Germany where Holocaust denial is illegal, and they have the carte blanche to meet with people, to meet with government officials, they're not arrested and that sort of thing. Whereas in Germany, for example, it, it is a crime to deny the Holocaust, and yet the Iran, the Iran and Germany do all sorts of business. So, on sort of the micro level, the, the really dangerous stuff, is it being addressed by these organizations and these definitions? Because it seems to me that, on the one hand, Iran has a nuclear weapons program that is obviously dangerous and is a uh, cause for concern. 
my feeling is that somehow it will be dealt with, but this unleashing of the protocols of the elders of Zion is a narrative that's beginning to have traction throughout the world is really dangerous and it's not being addressed. So, so all this, although this work is, I think, very important, are these institutions missing the, the big picture, or are they addressing the big picture of the rest of it? I think, certainly within the Jewish world, we are very aware of Iran um, and its activities. Iran is not the only country for activities. Um, Egypt uh, does so, some of the other countries do so. In Malaysia, there's an enormous, there's a very effective publishing agency which publishes anti Semitic material. But Iran is certainly the world leader in, anti in promoting anti Semitism. And Jewish organizations are very aware of this. I would say a couple of things um, in response to the question. It's difficult to make country-specific condemnations with international organizations. It's against the rules. Um, you cannot, for example, at an OSCE or United Nations meeting, get up and specifically say, I condemn Iran. Uh, it's against the rules. So it means you have to work in other ways. It, it, it's you know the, these are the basic rules of, of intergovernmental organisations. You have to work in other ways. Um, certainly, um, most West European countries, governments and agencies are aware of what Iran is doing. Uh, they see that the Iranians uh, are prepared to work with and fund the whole range of extremist groups from the far right to the far left, um, the conference that uh, Iran uh, organized on Holocaust denial uh, was of, or details of it were of interest uh, to my government at least and some of its agencies and will continue to be. So at a certain level there is an interest and there is a monitoring but given the state of international relations it's not their priority they would therefore rely on uh, NGOs and organizations like mine uh, to provide them with the information for which they are very grateful. Combating Iran and its promotion of hatred um, is something that is moving up the agenda of most of the larger Jewish organizations. <coughs> World Jewish Congress made a policy decision last year that Iran would be the focus of much of its work going forward. Um, there is likely to be a greater uh, complementary working between other Jewish organizations as a consequence of a major piece of research done by an Israeli institute, the Rayot Institute, which focuses on producing, together with the Israel Foreign Ministry, a better strategy for combating anti-Semitism and for looking at the areas from which it comes and to get Jewish organizations to focus better on combating that in the various ways that it is possible. So I would say that one actually couldn't, one shouldn't conflate the strategic threat from Iran, which really does bother governments, uh, with the other threat from Iran, which is that of anti promotion of anti-Semitism. Uh, and given the fact that governments are so focused on the former, it's up to Jewish organizations to press the case about the second. But it's certainly moving quite rapidly up in our agenda. I hope that's... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Is there, is there a correlation between governmental recognition of the problem of anti-Semitism and in Western Europe the rapid in increase of Arabic and Muslim uh, immigrants? Not necessarily. Okay. Muslim immigrants 
virtually do not exist east of Germany. In other words, this is a problem for some Western European states. France, Belgium, Scandinavia. The presence of Muslim immigrants is not in itself, I think, a problem. I think what is a problem is the penetration of Islamist ideology <coughs> and extremism into those communities. But by no means has it taken over those communities. Some of those Muslim communities are like the German uh, Muslim community, but by and large secular, they're not religious. And these influences don't really play out. I would also say that the majority of Muslims in those West European countries are not uh, necessarily anti-Semitic. What happens is that tensions rise, the anger rises when there's tension in the Middle East. Uh, a Muslim friend with whom I work says, okay, um, that may be the case, but a growing default position amongst some young Muslims, certainly in Britain, uh, is anti-Semitic. But I don't think the correlation can necessarily be made. There is, at the same time, a growing hatred of Muslims, which is manifesting itself on the streets, you know, attacks on mosques and so on. What bothers governments uh, is the fact that racial violence is rising. And certainly in Western Europe, um, they are determined to, to, to really deal with that. And anti-Semitism forms a part of that. And that's why these programs are becoming effective. I would say with the accession states, the European Union, mostly former Soviet Union satellites, um, it's a different problem. Firstly, they have no large Muslim communities. Their problem is, if there is violence or hate crime, it's against Roma and Sinti, not against Muslims, uh, so at least in the southern states. Um, but many of them don't have legislation yet. They've emerged from however many years of Soviet rule, and they are still putting in place democratic institutions and legislation to deal with hate crime. So they're in a slightly different position. Answer you. Fully. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I'm, uh, I find the, uh, the, the description you, you, get, you gave some, somewhat wanting. You, you, you mentioned there's a lot of organization, a lot of meeting, meetings. And, um, uh, and occasionally there's something published, and you also occasionally refer to some legislation well, you didn't describe what that was. What exactly do you do? What are all of these guys, mediums, etc.? What action do they take that are that are meaningful and effective? I don't. Yeah, you know, I hear some vague reference to it in, in legislation, that, but that's all I've heard. It's an important question. What's going on? <laughs> What are the effects on the ground? How do they affect ordinary people? I think, given the fact that we're only a few years into this process, it's probably quite difficult to give a definitive answer. I don't think one will emerge for a generation or two. Given the fact that anti-Semitism has been prevalent in Europe uh, for nearly two millennia, uh, given the fact that a primary source of it was the church or the churches and that these churches uh, have only removed the deicide stigma in fairly recent years. So we're dealing with millennia of, um, of influences which we have to counteract. What are the effects therefore on the ground? What are we doing? I mentioned the, e, the OSCE's education um, initiatives. And I said I would come back if somebody asked 
what the OSC's Human Rights Affiliate, ODIA, has done is to get the Anne Frank Institute, the Anne Frank Centrum uh, in Amsterdam, and Yad Vashem to produce school books for all school children so far, I think in 11 states, uh, in the languages of those states, so that 15 and 16 year olds in the normal school curriculum learn about anti-Semitism, Jews' contribution to Europe, and about racism as a matter of the national, it's part of the national curriculum. That is a process that is only now starting. Hopefully, it will have some effect. We know that not all schools have enough money to buy the books. I mean, the funding for this comes uh, generally from the, the national government. So a country like the Ukraine doesn't have the money to buy school books for every school kid. But hopefully, uh, most schools will get. That's one area which I think will, in due course, have some effect. Another area that ODIA does uh, very effectively is law enforcement training. Most of these states, as I said, have no hate, hate crime legislation. You've got it in the States, we've got it in the UK, most West European countries have it. Countries joining the European Union have to have it, but a lot of these other countries don't have it. So what they're doing is training law enforcement to recognize, to investigate, to monitor hate crime. There are all sorts of problems because they don't necessarily have the legislation which will allow, which will permit law enforcement agencies to do this work. So that's why they have model legislation. That's why, for example, Ukraine has just bought a package which includes training for law enforcement, for prosecutors and for the judiciary. No point in having policemen arrest somebody for a hate crime if there's no legislation. No point in the prosecutors don't know how to prosecute it. And certainly no point if the judiciary don't recognize it and understand that whilst it's crime, it's a particular form of crime, which may carry, for example, as it does in most West European states and in the US, enhanced penalties. We're talking about trying to change history and it's going to take a long time but that is essentially what these organizations are working on when I was uh, in Vienna last week um, I was looking at I was working with the fundamental rights agency and had not been aware that uh, I mean aware of most of their programs but had not been aware that they are finalizing uh, a program of Holocaust remembrance commemoration and education within the school system of all the European Union states. Smaller than the OSCE, um, but that it will sort of, it will be coming at states through two different organizations. Um, secondly, that they are planning large scale polling on members of the Jewish community's perceptions of anti-Semitism. You need regular polling in order to assess whether the situation is getting better, where the Jews think it's getting better. Uh, and they are putting in place now, uh, for 2011, uh, a wide-scale, across-Europe, uh, polling uh, mechanism. So, I mean, that's what's happening on the ground, but it's going to take a long time. So, so if I can push you, I'll push you a bit more probably for this question. I'm not going to be the diplomatic of the have yeah. yeah, but anyway, so I can be uh... <laughs> So if, if this is a slow process and you're trying to change thousands of years of history, as you said, what, what's the point in that if you take a, you know, in a sense, Europe is basically a cemetery of Jewish civilization, except for several communities that exist. We, the, the Holocaust, or Donald says, it was enlightenment, it was Europe that died in Auschwitz, right? So if we're helping communities to commemorate the extermination of Jewish civilization, and it's a slow, painstaking process, it's very nice. But on the other hand, we have a vibrant Jewish community, a Jewish civilization, a Jewish society in Israel that's now being targeted for another genocide. Uh, and I'm measuring my words very carefully. This is, there's a social movement that is 
genocidal and it's anti-Semitism. And Europe is doing business with the perpetrators. It's actually giving them arms to carry out their deeds. What's the purpose of this? What are they there are 13 next? million Jews in Europe who think that they've got a future there. Uh, no, no, sorry, not 13 no. million. There are a couple of million Jews in Europe who think they've got a, a future there. They don't intend to live anywhere else but in Europe. Some countries... So, okay, so England, France, and... Uh, Spain. Spain. Spain, if, if you... I mean, Spain has attracted in something like 30,000 Jews in recent years, primarily from Latin America. There are tax breaks, or there used to be tax breaks, if you could prove Sephardi heritage and you wanted to live in Spain in recent years. The Spanish government wants to attract Jews. Germany has taken in 110,000 Jews from Russia. These Jews are not going anywhere. Um, so there are some people in, in Iran. There is still Jewish people there. Of course, there. I have contact with them. I have direct contact with them. And they don't, want, they don't even think of moving out? No, I, I would suggest that they ought to, but they think <laughs> otherwise. Uh, but no, I, I think you've got to recognize that many Jews do not consider going to Israel. They intend to live in the countries where they're living, and that by and large, European states want them to stay and are making it easier for them. The Spanish government is funding the regeneration in part of the Jewish community in Spain. The German government, likewise. How do I they make it easier for them? You say to make, they make it easier for them? By funding the institutions. Institution development, co uh, funding infrastructure development in Jewish communities. Um, I think if you're dealing with anti-Semitism, we've got to deal with it in two ways: bottom up and top down. The top down is a diplomatic initiative. Bottom up is working with Jewish communities. Uh, let, let me just say, it's easy to criticise some European states for doing business with Iran. The US also. Yes, that's right. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think we should be pointing the finger at any one state or any one continent. Uh, most of the websites, most of the websites of the most virulent anti-Semitic NGOs uh, are hosted in the United States. Um, America does business with Iran as well. I know it's pushing the sanctions regime, and I know that there are certainly a couple of countries in Europe that um, break sanctions, but Just diplomatic diplomatic Europe. pressure on them uh, is vital. But there wasn't a Holocaust. And there wasn't a Holocaust here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that they're... I'm, uh, look, forecasting is difficult. I don't think that most European Jews see a Holocaust coming again in the same fashion as it did in the past. Uh, well, I was thinking about Israel. I'm not saying there's going to be a Holocaust. That, 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 that's a separate thing. I mean, we obviously want to help and are supportive of Israel, and we do a lot of work on behalf of Israel. The Israel government has to carry out its own foreign policy. We would work with them, but it's down to the Israeli government. We are not Israeli citizens. Um, we, we the work, I mean, the. We is who? Sorry? We is who? Jewish organizations. Yeah. We would work with Israel. If Israeli something government. happened to Israel, the Jews all over the world are going to suffer. Of course. Because it's like the mother that we have over there. Of course. And I can see that you're Israeli. Yes, I am. Uh, and Israel is in my heart, yes, even it's though I'm well. here. I have grandchildren in Israel. Uh, it's in it's in every majority of Jews' heart. And I we, don't think uh, we have to work together. We have to work together. And I don't think uh, Obama makes it very easy, also. So that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I know my problem as an American. Yes. So you got a question? Yeah. First, I'll recover. Um, I, uh, my question is. I think it's very important to work on the level of education uh, legislation, on the lo for, uh, in, especially on the long term. But is there a political will to, to act on the level of European governments now against hate crime now that is taking 
example, in Germany, you have you can you can receive Almanar, which is a broadcast from Hezbollah, and they have now legislation that it's no longer allowed to uh, sh show it in, in hotels. But this is not the problem. The problem is that people watch it in their homes. So, what do you think? Is there um, is there a political will to stop this on on the European level, and what can be done? There is a growing perception with, uh, within European governments that hate crime is something that affects everybody in Europe and that it has potential to be seriously destabilizing. I think there is a political will. Uh, I see it. I see it in the programs that are being funded. But of course, not enough is being done. Part of the, uh, the way of combating this is to fund programs, training law enforcement, <coughs> training uh, teachers, and so on. Uh, and always more money can be used. But I, I get the impression uh, that there is a very strong political will. I was talking about the Fundamental Rights uh, Agency, which has a much more uh, powerful role than the EUMC had, um, whereas initially, uh, and certainly before the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the European government would have had to, or might have had to consult uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency if there was any human rights implication in planned European legislation. Now they absolutely have to. Uh, and within the work programs uh, of the European Commission and the European Union, I've got the draft um, work programs. There is a lot about combating hate crime and anti semitism So the short answer is to your question, is there a political will? Yes, because it's in the hate program. It's in the work programs. As far as Al Manar is concerned, you know that it's actually banned throughout Europe. Eurosat was forbidden to carry it. What you can do, of course, is access Al Manar in America. You access it through Saudi Arabian-based satellite broadcasting network. You cannot do it through any European satellite network because of the ban. Um, you've got a computer and you you can access it anywhere. Yeah. I, I was impressed really with your uh, tedious work with reaching government, affecting uh, government legislation. But the final goal should be to affect the masses, in my opinion, not the governments. And what I, my observation is that uh, the Iranians or, and their, their collaborators don't go to any government institutions. They, go, they have their, they use uh, propaganda means that have been uh, perfected by uh, Goebbels and the other Nazis, and they go directly to the public. Is there any consideration given to basically mirror everything and reverse it and attack the attackers using their own methods and reaching the public that way? Means I'm 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 I believe in more um, aggressive rather than passive or defensive methods of dealing with the subject of anti-Semitism. But traditionally, the Jews have defended themselves and tried to demonstrate how good they are, what their contribution to civilization had been. But that wasn't good enough. It's still proven to be not good enough. My organization is the successor to the Jewish fighting groups that were established in the wake of the Second World War to fight Nazis on the street, near Nazis on the streets of London and Manchester. We have always taken an aggressive view of combating anti-Semitism. <laughs> but you've got to use your head as well, and not just your fists and your feet. Yeah, okay. And I also would say that Iran is not the sole source of anti-Semitism. It's true, it's the only government which uses anti-Semitism as, as a part of state policy. <coughs> 
But in many European countries, Iran is not the source of anti-Semitism. It's the millennia of history. The answer to your question is that we are much more aggressive. Uh, but we've never stopped being aggressive. We combat anti-Semitism where we see it and where we find it. But we, we have to consider the best ways to do it. Uh, and no longer do we fight people on the streets. Now we have to do it through a diplomatic arena or through legislation. I mean, we have been um, very pleased to see in recent years that most European governments will prosecute anti-Semitism where it is illegal. We don't have to push European governments to prosecute now. They will do it uh, without, push, without any effort from us reminding them of the legislation on the statute books. They do it because they recognize that it's good for their country. But I think that you have to work at two levels. I mentioned it before. You've got to work at the top down, at the diplomatic level, at the intergovernmental level, and you've got to work from the bottom up. You've got to work with the masses. You've got to work with the education system. You've got to teach the hate that anti-Semitism affects all society and that when it's allowed, or when it carries on unchecked, you get the Shah. So it's something that affects all society. And we've got to work at those different levels through education processes in particular. <clears throat> Dealing with uh, naked anti-Semitism is one thing. But a great deal of the anti-Semitism that we see <coughs> is thinly disguised as being anti-Israel, anti-Zionist. Do your organizations deal with that? For example, attempts to bar Israeli academics and Israeli scientists from participating in programs in, in, in Europe. Uh, and just recently, uh, you'll know better than I the name of the organization, uh, an advertising standards agency barring an Israeli tourism ad for featuring the Western Wall saying, that's not in Israel, you can't claim it. Um, yeah, you can argue the point politically. To me, I know what that is. Uh, do the organizations you mentioned deal with that kind of stuff? Our focus is on anti-Semitism rather than defending Israel. There are other organizations that deal with that. But we recognize that increasingly uh, anti-Zionism can be a cloak for just old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Uh, but we're not taking the ASA's uh, ruling on um, on the old city and the wall uh, lying down. But in fact, it's not for us to do it. It's for the Israeli government and for the tourist agency in London. And uh, people sort of don't seem to realize that. We actually have no locus there. It's for the Israelis to, to protest. Uh, as far as, um, for example, uh, boycott of uh, academics is concerned, I wouldn't say it's been defeated, but it, it isn't happening uh, in the UK. It really isn't. In fact, academic exchanges are growing. Um, that's not to say that there aren't a small group of people who demonstrate outside stores selling Israeli products, but generally they are not being effective. Uh, and in fact, within the Jewish community, there's a, a sort of a counter effort to go to those stores where there are demonstrations outside in order to buy more Israeli products. Um, but, I mean, to get to the basic point, we recognize that increasingly anti-Zionism uh, is just a claim for old-fashioned anti-Semitism. And in that sense, then, yes, of course, we'll get involved. But we are not an agency. It's my own organization. It's not an agency uh, that, that does work on behalf of Israel. We work on behalf of the Jews of the UK. God forbid we should be accused of dual loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to. You know, I don't have to answer those. Things. My family have lived in England hundreds of years. At the diplomatic level, are your activities of, of the various organizations you mentioned confined to Europe, or do you establish any sort of 
diplomatic contacts with what I'll call moderate Islamic states in the Middle East that all have what you're trying to do. Of course. Of course we are. We were. Have they been effective? Yes. In fact, I was due to go to a conference a couple of years ago in Morocco uh, on anti-Semitism within the Arab world. It was cancelled, but it is going to take place. Um, there uh, are all sorts of contacts, all sorts of visits. I mean, they're growing. They're not as big as they should be. They're not with all Muslim states, but they certainly exist. Uh, and, uh, and I put up that the, um, is it the, the Aladdin Foundation of Paris, so they, yeah. uh, can, they put on a, at the UNESCO a year ago, I was at the, the, organiza the, the uh, organiza Organization of Islamic Countries put on a, an event at UNESCO through this organization called the Aladdin Al Project, which brings Muslim intellectuals and leaders um, and Jewish scholars together to fight anti Semitism. It was incredible. There were 3,000 diplomats and religious leaders from the Islamic world there. The head of the Organization of Islamic Countries, as the President of Senegal, spoke uh, about Holocaust denial, the very moving uh, speech. And I think there's tremendous concern. I, 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 my perception, I'm not an expert in this, but I think some Islamic uh, societies, like uh, countries like Senegal, that have, have uh, had uh, peaceful relations with minorities in their society for generations are very concerned about the rise of radical Islam, they're concerned about the rise of uh, Wahhabism, Iran, and they are opposed to Holocaust denial, and they're doing a lot of good work on this issue. So there are good institutions and societies and religious leaders in the Muslim world who see the rise of uh, say genocidal anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial as a warning sign to their own societies, the rise of extremism. There's a conference in Paris in, uh, in June on perceptions of the Holocaust in the Arab world, or in the Muslim world, um, which, I mean, it's not a governmental level, it's NGO level. Um, and half the participants will be Muslims from the Middle East and from Are the Saudis among them? I have no idea. No idea. That's not, well, I think not, but I've had contacts with Saudi diplomats. They approached Jewish NGOs a few years ago. I mean, things have gone slow, uh, but some diplomats did approach Jewish NGOs and lead Jewish leaders a couple of years ago saying, right, let's put the Israel-Palestine issue to one side, we would like contact with, with, with Jews, Jewish businessmen, Jewish leaders. I wanted to know how your organization is reacting to the elections in Hungary, where the right got a phenomenal amount of votes, and the Nazi Party got the same as the National the Social Democrats. It's very, very, very worrying what's happening in Hungary. I mean, the rise of Jobbik yeah. uh, and Fidesz, um, which I think almost mirrored in, in, in some other countries like the Czech Republic as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could almost say in Poland under the previous administration. Mm -hmm. Some European countries, um, in the face of economic downturn, um, are turning on their minorities um, and allowing the rise of far right parties, um, which are sort of based on pre-war neo-Nazi groups uh, or fascist ideology and it's very very worrying I mean I hope it's a short term thing um, that as economies pick up these groups um, lose power or lose support but certainly Hungary is very concerning and you saw I mean you would have read that the Jewish community organized a big demonstration uh, in Budapest um, 10 days ago to demonstrate against it. I was in Budapest um, just over a year ago at a conference on anti-Semitism where the organizers' um, plan was to wake up the Jewish leadership uh, to the problems that were growing in Hungary, uh, to give them information, to give them tools. Uh, and I'm glad to see that it's, it's, it's beginning to pay off. But it's really very worrying indeed.
mean, you, you see it also, the, the, not even just in Central European states, in Austria, they now got once again uh, dressed up a little bit, but essentially uh, the success at the Haider, um, very support, you know, growing support. Although in countries like France, Front National has declined drastically in support. Well, the support for Front National has declined drastically. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you that you um, make a distinction between the strategic threat from uh, that comes from Iran and the anti-Semitism, and I think uh, it's not really possible to do that because the strategic threat will um, or leads to a kind of appeasement in uh, in European countries, and I think if the strategic threat becomes bigger and bigger, then also, I mean, or if, if Iran would be, become nuclear, this would also lead to a rise of anti-Semitism. And so I think it's not, um, doesn't help so much to make this distinction and don't, don't uh, discuss it together because um, I, I see it uh, to be connected. The um, uh, rise in, of anti-Semitism in Europe in the future and um, Iran becoming a nuclear power. So I think one might have to see the, this uh, together, the strategic threat and the threat of um, a stronger anti-Semitism. And um, I disagree with you on, also on the point that uh, you, you, the United States, when you mentioned the United States having business with Iran, maybe there is some business there, but the main, uh, uh, you, I think you cannot compare the, the level of, of uh, business that is um, done uh, um, through European countries with Iran. And so I think it's very, very important to address this topic because it is related to 